my prayer is more, this morning is, is that you figure out how to make room for Jesus. If you don't get anything else right, that's one thing you got to figure out, right? We got to figure out how to stop and make time for Jesus. Because if we can't figure that out, if we can't figure out how to make time for Him, nothing else is going to work out. Does that make sense? We have to we have to have that special time, that special moment with Him. And that's what I want us, we're going to talk some about that today. But um, if you have your Bibles, I'm in Luke. Did you know that? <laughs> we're in chapter 7. We're finishing up uh, chapter 7. <clears throat> and we're going to finish up chapter 7 today. And we're going to start... Uh, uh, chapter 8, just the first few verses of chapter 8. <clears throat> and this, after today, we're going to be about a third the way through Luke. So we still got still got lots of more to go in Luke, but we're getting there. And I hope that you're taking some time and that you're spending some time reading the book of Luke. It's so important that if you will read this, read the passages, read the scriptures that I'm going to be preaching in here, that when I, when I give it to you, when I speak it to you, then it'll, it'll kind of open up some things for you to receive and understand. You'll have read it already. You'll be like, oh, it makes sense. So let's talk. Verse 18, Luke chapter 7, verse 18. It says, John, John's disciples told him about all these things. So I, we left off last week where John, and we're going we're gonna to go over that again, but his John, they're talking about John the Baptist. His disciples have been telling him about all that Jesus has been doing. John is in a prison um, because of uh, him basically calling out sin on Herod and T Antipas. And so that, this is basically why he's in prison. Um, verse 18, John's disciples told him all about these things, calling two of them, John calling two of them. He sent them to the Lord. He sent them to Jesus to ask, are you the one who is to come, or should we expect someone else? How many know sometimes we have doubts? Can I, there's no sin in doubting. Doubting should make you want to explore and understand more, right? Can I tell you that if all you do is you read this and you don't ask questions or you don't start talking, and you're not going to ever grow in your relationship. You, you have to want to explore it. You have to want to see more and understand more. God has so much that he wants to give to you in his word that we have to open up ourselves to see what he's saying and understand what he's saying. So here it is. He, John's asking the question. He says, ask, ask the Lord, ask Jesus the question. Are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? I mean, the guy's in prison. I can imagine there's some doubts creeping in, right? He's struggling right now. And he's asking his, his two of his disciples to go ask Jesus, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? In verse 20, when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And at that very moment, Jesus uh, cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits, and gave sight to many who were blind. This verse is important when, when Jesus gives his answer. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. Verse 23, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Now I want to begin this morning by saying the most important thing about us is what we think of Jesus. You hear what I'm saying? It's important that we get a picture, get an understanding of who we think Jesus is. 
We, we have to get that. We have to understand that. In your mind, who is Jesus? In your mind, when you think about Jesus, who is he? Because the identity of Jesus Christ, that's the most important decision that has to be settled. You have to know who Jesus Christ is. And we will see all throughout the book of Luke, people are asking that question, who is this man? Who is this Jesus that's healing, that's casting out demons, that, that, that when he speaks, even the winds and the waves are calmed? And they're asking that all throughout the book of Luke, all throughout the Gospels. They ask that question, who is Jesus? And we have to get to the point that we understand who Jesus is. And so as we're going through Luke, you have to discover for yourself who Jesus is to you. And it's in this moment that we see John, I've said he's starting to doubt. He's having these, these doubts. Think about other people that had doubts. Moses had doubts, right? Jeremiah wanted to quit the ministry. Go read that book. And you're talking about some depressing stuff, right? And then Elijah, Elijah wanted to die. He's like, man, I just want to be out of this miserable world. He was running for his life. Doubting is not a sin if it leads you to explore who God is more. Do you get what I'm saying? Do you hear what I'm saying? Doubting is not a sin if it leads you to explore who God is more. The problem comes when your doubt leads to stop searching for the truth. Don't ever stop looking. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And, and if you don't understand who the truth is, Jesus is the truth. You can find the truth in his word, and you need to explore, dig deep, get to an understanding that you know who Jesus is. And it was Jesus that said in John chapter 8, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. And that just that's amazing, right? I don't know about you, but we talked about hell lost another one. I am free. I am free. That's some powerful words, is it not? Hell lost another one. I am free. Guess what? I've been set free by the blood of Jesus, and we can walk in the freedom and in the victory that we have. When we have Jesus in our heart and in our life, we're set free because we know the truth that Jesus is the truth. And it's when we stop searching for the truth that we get ourselves in trouble, right? When we stop searching and stop believing, that's when we get ourselves in trouble. Don't stop searching for the truth. That is what John the Baptist is doing here. Doubt is creeping in, and so he sends two of his disciples to search for the truth, and Jesus sends back a reply that John would understand. Now, many of us, we may not get it. Look at verse 22. This is what he said. So he replied to the messengers, Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. This was Jesus' answer, and what Jesus is showing John that what was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 35, and this is what Isaiah 35 verses 4 through 6 says, Say to those with fearful hearts, Be strong, do not fear. Your God will come. He will come with vengeance, with divine retribution. He will come to save you. Then will the eyes of the blind be opened and the ears of the deaf, deaf unstopped. Then will the lame leap like a deer and the mute tongue shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. This is the message right here that I just read to you that Jesus is giving John the Baptist and through this John will know that Jesus is in fact the Messiah. And it's through the scriptures. So Jesus is basically quoting uh, Isaiah 35 and he's saying hey, go tell him this. He'll, he'll know when you tell him what I just told you, John's going to know that I am who he thinks I am. And Jesus is reassuring uh, John that he is here. And then in verse 24, Jesus begins to speak about John the Baptist. Now, how many of you think John the Baptist was a pretty good dude, right? I mean, he did some amazing stuff. Jesus is about to confirm that. It says, after John's messengers left, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. And I think what Jesus might be doing is because 
there might have been some of the people in the crowd thinking, you know, was Jesus chastising John? Is is there a is there a quarrel going on? I, you know, I mean, I mean, some of us we would probably think, man, what's going on there? But then when Jesus turns around and he says, listen, and he says this, um, what did you uh, go out into the wilderness to see? A reed swayed by the wind. In other words, if you ever seen the the reeds like close to a um, uh, a water bank when the wind, they're just, oh, I mean, they're all over the place, right? I mean, they're just swaying back and forth. And that's, that's, that's his analogy here. And verse 25, if not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? <laughs> John was definitely not a man dressed in fine clothes. Uh, no, those who wear expensive clothes and indulge in luxury are in palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. So here, Jesus is confirming to them, he's letting them know there's no one greater than John the Baptist. He's, he's the greatest. He's the best. And then Jesus says this, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Let me explain that. You see, when John's disciples left to go tell him the news, Jesus is reassuring everyone that John is who they thought he was, and Jesus wanted everyone to understand just how great John was. And I find it interesting, while studying for this message, that the man that put John in prison, Herod Antipas, placed a reed as an emblem on his coins a few years earlier. Maybe Jesus is making a reference saying, hey, if you were looking for this reed guy, you know, this reed flapping, maybe you need to go look at Herod because he's kind of all flighty and he's definitely not a good dude. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that. He didn't say that, but he's making a reference to a reed. But Jesus is wanting the people to understand that John stood up for the truth and Jesus shows them that John was the one fulfilling the prophecy in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1 that says, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me, then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. Now, so Jesus is clarifying that John is great in verse 28. That's, that's pretty good. John is great in verse 28. So there you go. There's your rhyme. If you ever want to know what verse 28 says, you got it. I tell you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than than John, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now, so what made John great? Number one, he was filled with the Holy Spirit at birth. And that, that's, that's pretty amazing, right? He was a faithful representative of God. He, he never turned. He always stayed to his convictions. Number three, he funneled people to God. He was the one that was pointing the way. Number four, he is the final Old Testament prophet. Luke 16, 16 confirms that. And number five, he is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He went before Christ proclaiming to those that prepare the way, right? He was preparing the way. And so these are the five things that make John great. But then Jesus tells us in Luke, uh, or in verse 28, I tell you among, um, at the end of it, he says, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Talking about greater than John the Baptist. So how can you and I be greater than John the Baptist? Let me explain. John announced the kingdom and he prepared the way, right? The kingdom, listen to me, is always greater than the announcement of the kingdom. And we, you and I, as believers of Jesus Christ, we're no longer a part of this world, but you have made a reservation to be a part of God's kingdom. That, that's good news, right? So there you go. Jesus is telling us that those of us who are believers, that we are a part of God's kingdom, we are greater than John the Baptist. And he's a pretty cool dude, right? So that means that we can go out and do the things that, that we are to prepare. We are to show people the way. We are to lead people and, and let them see the kingdom of God and how awesome God is. These next two verses, you could label the great divide if you want because Luke is pointing out two groups of people 
that were listening to what Jesus was saying. Look at verse 29. It says, all the people, even the tax collectors, those were pretty, they were, they were pretty salty dudes, right? I mean, they were down on the bottom of the totem pole. Uh, when they heard Jesus' word, acknowledged that God's way was right because they had been baptized by John. So these people, I mean, they, they, they knew they were sinners. They confessed that they were sinners. And look at verse 30. But the Pharisees and the experts in the law rejected God's purpose for themselves because they had not been baptized by John. They didn't feel like they needed it. Eh, we don't need it. We're good. You see, John's baptism was a baptism of confession and repentance. The problem with the group in verse 30 is they were self-righteous people. They thought, man, we're great. We're, we got it made. We know the scriptures frontwards and backwards. The only problem is they didn't have a right relationship with God the way that you and I should have, right, as believers. They were caught up in, in A, B, and C, making sure they get the rules right, that they weren't focused on the relationship right. We've got to get the relationship. When I told you in the beginning that we've got to make sure that we know who Jesus is and that we understand who Jesus is and we spend time with Jesus and we make room for Jesus, all those things are important. Those are the important things that we need to know, that we need to understand that, that, that that's who God is and how much He loves us and how much He cares for us. They had the mentality, I am good enough. I don't need what John said. They were shallow people. And they had a shallow view of how bad their sin was. John Owen said this, He who has a shallow view of sin has a shallow view of God. That's pretty good, isn't it? He who has a shallow view of sin has a shallow view of God. And then Jesus continues in verse 31. He says this, Jesus went on to say, To what then can I compare the people of this generation? What are they like? They were like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other. We played the pipe for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not cry. For John the Baptist came neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you say, here is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. But with wisdom is proved right by all her children. So Jesus compares the people to children at play. Now, I remember when I was a kid, some of y'all may have did this too. We used to like to play. Me and my cousins would get together. My sisters, me and my sister, my two cousins, we always hung out together. We liked to play church. Anybody ever play church when you was kids? I don't know. We always we had the preacher. Guess who always got stuck being the preacher? It was me, and everybody else got to do the other thing. So. I, I got. To, I, I would act like the preacher. We'd have the. We'd have the choir sing. I mean, we had it all. We had everything. There's only four of us, and we had it all. You know, we did it all, and we played church. We'd also. You ever played house? You remember playing house? You know, you'd have kitchen and and all. So this is what Jesus is describing. He's the, he's describing the children playing in the streets. They would mimic what the adults were doing. So the adults would be out there. They would be having a marriage ceremony, right? Dancing and celebrating just like you would do in a, in a marriage ceremony. Or they'd be having a funeral that would parade through the streets and they would play a sad song and everybody would cry. And so that's what the children would do. They were mimicking what the adults were doing in their playtime. They would play like a marriage ceremony. They would be having a marriage and, and they'd, they'd be doing everything they do. They'd be singing and dancing and having a good time. Or they would pretend to have a funeral and they would play the music and they would cry and be sad because they were mimicking what the adults were doing. And that's what children like to do in their playtime, right? They like to mimic what the adults are doing. They want to grow up a little faster than they, they should. But, but this is what they would do, and, and, and they would do this, and that's what he's referring to. So that's when, when he says in verse 32, they were like children sitting in the marketplace and calling out to each other, we played the pipe for you, and you did not dance, we sang a dirge, and you did not cry. And because of how John was, um, because how John was, the people would say that John was too strict. Oh, uh, he's too strict. He's, I can't believe that he's as strict as he is. He's that hellfire and brimstone type guy, you know. 
And then Jesus came around, and, and the people said that Jesus took too much liberty. He's just going out. He's partying with the tax collectors. I mean, because if you remember, we had a, a, a few few uh, verses before. Um, Jesus is at Matthew's house having a party, right? And he's getting to know. He's got the he, Matthew has his Jesus friends there, and he has his sinner friends. They've all come together. They're just having this one big party. And so that's what the religious leaders were looking, and they were saying, well, I can't believe John's the way he is. And then they're on the other hand, they're looking at Jesus. Well, I can't believe they could never get it right. They could never figure out who they wanted to go for. And so they just griped and complained about everybody else. They were just a bunch of spoiled little brats. Now, we hear this today as well, don't we? You know what I'm talking about, anybody? Well, we hear, that preacher preaches too long, or he preaches too short, or the music's too long, or there's not enough hymns, or the pastor doesn't use enough illustrations in his message, or he has way too many illustrations, right? The problem is not the messenger. It's the mess that we have made it, right? It's the mess that we have made it. We need to get our personal feelings out of the way and just let God be God, amen? It's time that we let God be God, be who he has called us to be and move to the level that God wants us to become to and not worry about everything else and all the other stuff. But we need to think about spending more time in the presence of God than we do about how the message is presented. And then Luke moves from this to a story that I believe is one of the most important stories for us today. If you don't get anything else from what I am going to say to you you need to get this. You need to understand this. Look at this story in verse 36. This is the one I've been talking about. It says, When one of the Pharisees invited Jesus to have dinner with him, he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. A woman in that town who had lived a sinful life learned that Jesus was eating at the Pharisee's house. So she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume. As she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back. So he forgave the debts of both. Now which of them will love him more? Simon replied, well, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. The other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sin? See, there's that question again. Who is this Jesus? And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Now I have some thoughts along with some questions about this story. First of all, why would a Pharisee invite Jesus to his house? <laughs> right? Pharisees hated Jesus. Why would he invite Jesus to come to his house? And there are possibly a couple of answers here. It was a local Pharisee, and it was a custom to invite visiting rabbis to come to their home. So this is a possibility. The second thing is Jesus became a controversial celebrity. And it might have become cool to have him at his house, right? I mean, you're the hosting Pharisee in this town. And Jesus 
has created a lot of controversy up to this point, right? I mean, we've read about a bunch of it. Every time you turn around, remember we talked a few weeks ago, every time you turn around, the Pharisees are like in the bushes, like on Hee Haw, and they pop up, and what's going on here, you know? That's what it reminds me of. And uh, I can just, I can imagine that. Maybe, I don't know if you can. I just see them popping about, well, you're doing this wrong, and you're doing that. Why are your disciples doing this? I mean, they're just all over the place. So he was a very controversial leader, and, and so this makes sense too. Hey, let's, let's invite the controversial celebrity to come to our house and eat. Here's the interesting part. So the first question was, why would he invite Jesus to his house? But then here's the other thing. Protocol was you would be greeted by the host. So this Pharisee, Simon, is supposed to greet Jesus because Simon's the host. He's supposed to, have, when Jesus comes to his house, um, he would greet him. All would be placed on his head and, and your sandals would be taken off and your feet would be washed but Jesus came in and he just sat down so Simon didn't, pro, didn't follow protocols at all and so now the question about the lady how did she get in there because there's no way on earth that Simon would have uh, would have invited this lady of the night uh, into his house into this area and there's probably no way that she was invited, an invited guest. But think about it this way. So here's the way it was. So the houses, you'd have a courtyard, and there would be like three uh, on uh, – so let's just imagine a square courtyard, okay? And there'd be three houses that all faced into the courtyard, and then a fourth area would be opened up. And so people would walk by on the streets, and you could see into the courtyards, Okay. And so you could walk, so they could just walk in off the street. So possibly um, the way it's understood is they were eating probably in this courtyard and, and she was walking by, possibly had seen Jesus. Don't know this, but we can just kind of imagine through uh, um, um, customs and, and uh, uh, um, I can't think of the word, uh, tradition uh, that they could, as they were walking, it could see into this courtroom, this courtyard, and she'd probably heard Jesus speaking. Now, let me say this. If you take the four Gospels and you put them in chronological order, do you hear what I'm saying? So A, B, C, D happening in chronological order. There was a um, thing that was, uh, Jesus had spoken about, in chronological order, he had spoken about um, um, being set free, uh, you know, sins forgiven prior to this happening, okay? And so she may have heard a message of Jesus. I mean, the popularity of Jesus was all over the place, right? I mean, everybody knew who he was. He's gaining popularity. I mean, it's it's people are going, they're, they're seeking him out because they want to be touched. They want to be healed. They've seen the miracles that he's done. And they, they want that. They want a piece of that. But So that could have been why she was there. But at this meal, all the guests would be seated at what is called a triclinium. Okay? And it was like a, you would, you would kind of lean. Your meal would be in front of you, and your feet would kind of be behind you. And you would eat the meal as you're laying down. Uh, so Jesus' feet are behind him. The woman lets down her hair. Now, let me say this. Her letting down her hair would have been a reason for her husband to divorce her back then. But it didn't matter to her because she was probably uh, a lady of the night. And so Simon sees this lady. He has these thoughts if he only knew who was touching him. And can I just say you couldn't have chosen two people that were more different than Simon, the religious leader, and this woman, a lady of leisure. Two completely different people. And both of them are in the presence of Jesus. You have the host, an invited guest, and an uninvited intruder all in the same house. Now, not in Luke. And I was talking about this chronological order. Jesus preached, come all ye sinners, and I'll give you rest. Don't you think or imagine that I'm sure she doesn't like what she's doing. She's probably miserable. 
And here she is. She sees this one that has told her that if you come, I'll give you rest. And maybe she's like, I want that rest. I'm weary. I'm hurting. I need a touch. I need something that's not just being used and being abused. I need to be set free. I need freedom. I need I need Jesus. He's talked about touching people. He's talked about ministering to people. I want what he's talking about. And I can just imagine her coming in. They're sitting around this on their tri- their triclinniums. They're all around this table. Jesus is there. She she's seen who he, she knows who he is and I can just imagine her walking in and just begin preparing him to be the guest, not her house, but preparing to be the guest of this house. And she's weeping. And her tears are touching the feet of Jesus. She's got this expensive perfume. And I don't I don't I don't know what how she bought this perfume. She was a lady of the evening. She probably had all anything she wanted given to her. And she's using this perfume to anoint Jesus. And she's using her own hair to wipe the dirt. Because they walked everywhere. Their feet were nasty. And she's using the tears that are falling from her face. And she's just wanting to spend time with Jesus. And I'm sure in that moment she's thinking all these thoughts. He's the one that said that I could be set free. He's the one that I heard preaching that I could be clean. He's the one that was preaching that I could, my life could be changed forever. And she's just at awe of who he is. Now, if you're wondering, Jesus begins to tell Simon a story at this moment. All this is happening. And Jesus asked Simon. And basically in this story, uh, he mentions two amounts, 500 denarii and 50 denarii. Now, just so you kind of get an idea, 500 denarii is 20 months of wages. That's a lot. That's almost, that's almost two years of wages. 50 denarii is about two months of wages. It's still a lot, but not near what 500 denarii is. And in the story, you have two people needing forgiveness. In the house, you have two people at the dinner table needing. You see the, do you see the, the correlation here? Jesus is telling a story of two people, and there are two people right there, Simon and the woman. And this parable is giving Simon an example of the very situation that was in front of him. And I believe that all of us are a little like Simon. We tend to rely on a tentative righteousness, right? We look at our life and we say, you know, I'm not perfect, but I'm not as bad as that person. I mean, do we not? Do we look at some people and we think, well, I'm not a drug addict. You know, I'm not a prostitute. I'm not a drunkard. And we tend to label sins, right? The truth is it doesn't matter because we have all sin. Romans 3.23 says for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. However, in this story, the woman that was a great sinner has become a great saint. (laughs) Isn't that amazing? You see, our greatest need is forgiveness and God's greatest gift is to grant it to us. This woman came as a repentant sinner and she left as a changed woman. The Pharisee came as an unchanged sinner and he left unchanged. See, it doesn't matter what you are before you encounter Jesus. It's in what matters is who you become after the encounter takes place. You can be the most greatest spiritual person that you think you are and then whenever you meet Jesus, are you changed when you come out of that and you're the greatest person that Jesus wants you to be? It doesn't matter who you are prior to meeting Jesus. It's all in who you are after you met Jesus. Amen? 
And we have to learn how to spend time with Jesus. We have to learn how to come to the master's feet and say, Lord, I am, I am, I need forgiveness. I need you to change me. I need you to touch me. I need you to do something in my life that I, that's never been done before. And I need you to bring forgiveness into my life because I am a sinner and I need your redemption. Amen. That's who we need. We need to change. Yes, we need to change. When we meet Jesus, we need that change to take place. I want to close with the first three verses of chapter 8. These three verses are unique to Luke, okay? You won't see these three verses in any other gospel. But look at verse 1. Luke chapter 8, verse 1. It says, After this, Jesus traveled about from one town and village to another, Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God, the twelve were with him. And also some, some women who had been cured of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had come out. Don't you think she was grateful? <laughs> Joanna, the wife of Chusa, the manager of Herod's household. Susanna and many others. These women were helping to support them out of their own means. So Luke highlights the role of women in Jesus' ministry more than any other Gospels. Ladies, if you want to know about ministering the women that ministered back then, Luke's Gospel is a perfect example. And she's called this, or, I'm sorry, the three women listed here are Mary Magdalene, She's called this because she comes from the town of Magdala, okay? So that's how she got the, the association. A lot of times, if you look at Bible names, a lot of times they associate the person uh, with where they came from. I talked about Judas Iscariot a few weeks ago. Do you remember that? Uh, because of the region that he came from, the town that he came from is why he had the name Judas Iscariot because there was an, another Judas amongst Jesus' twelve, and that was the way they could distinguish it. I mean. He also was known as the one who betrayed Jesus every time that there's a list, but he kind of brought that on himself, right? I mean, you know, I mean, you get that, that reputation. Um, but what was it that made women drawn to Jesus? Now, we know that all people are drawn to Jesus, but there were several women that followed him, okay? So when, and I said this, I think a few weeks ago, when, when they mentioned the disciples, okay, uh, they always, the 12 are always included in that, but there's always more than just the 12. There, there's people following Jesus, just listening to his teaching. They want to they understand and know. But people were drawn to Jesus. And why was women drawn to Jesus? Uh, they followed him. And, and this drew quite a bit of controversy for Jesus too. Um, if, if you remember in, in the book of John, John chapter 4, he has the comfort, uh, con uh, a conversation with the woman at the well. You remember that? She had had, what, five husbands or something like that, and the one that she was with was not her husband either. I mean, so, I mean, she just, you know, and Jesus had this, uh, of course, you know about the woman that's being brought to be stoned. Um, you know, I mean, they're just so on. There's just so many. But let me be clear. I want everybody to understand this. Regardless of what you may or may not hear people say out there, Jesus never had a relationship with any woman sexually. People will tell you differently, but I'm here to tell you that Jesus never was married. He never had a, a, a relationship with a woman sexually. And there are some people that try to say that Jesus was married because of something that a false gospel said. And you may have heard about some erroneous sources that are called Gnostic Gospels. You may even remember the Da Vinci Code a few years ago. Uh, and these things, they tried to say that Jesus said he had a wife. The only source that should be referenced is the Holy Scriptures. Amen? And there is no place in the Holy Scriptures that says that Jesus was married. And nowhere in the Scriptures uh, did it ever say that he had a relationship with a woman that was sexually. So what do you think drew these women to Jesus? Now, I tend to think, and I will close with this, that Jesus was different from the other men that they were around. Do you hear what I'm saying? Women 
were the bottom of the ladder rung. <laughs> they were considered nothing in Jewish society, probably in, in, in the whole world at that time. But women were low. They were nothing. They were just an object. They were just there to have babies. That was it. That's the whole reason why they were there. And Jesus comes on the scene, and he's telling not only men, but he's telling women, you can be something in my kingdom, amen? And that's what he's telling them. And so here they are. They're attracted to Jesus, and they want to hear what Jesus is saying. And, and Jesus is just telling them that they can be more than they ever thought about being. They can be more than just a baby machine, amen? They can be something far greater in God's kingdom. And God has a plan for their life just like he has a plan for every man's life. Amen. God wants us to be great in the kingdom of God. And he has something great for us. And it's at the feet of Jesus that we can get that and we can understand that. But we have to learn to spend time at Jesus' feet. And I have to think, and I'm going to close with this, that Jesus was different I know that he was different. He loves us and he cares for us. He didn't shoo this woman away. This late, don't you think Jesus probably knew her reputation? Don't you think Jesus probably knew all that she had done? I mean, he's the king of kings and the lord of lords. He understood, he understood everything. And so as he's here, don't you think he understood? And he didn't shoo her away and just treat her like another object like everybody else had, had shooed, but he showed compassion for her. And I mentioned the woman that was brought to be stoned. He told all her accusers to, if they had, to, they had sinned, they had not sinned, to be the first to cast the stone. And each one of them drops and leaves her alone with Jesus. And Jesus told the woman to go and sin no more. Jesus he has a gentle, loving spirit about him. This woman that's in Simon's house and the three women mentioned here that supported Jesus financially all saw the compassion that Jesus possessed. And Jesus loves everyone. And he's shown that love to all people. And let me just close with this. We... We cannot think like we used to think. Do you hear what I'm saying? We, we cannot think like we used to think anymore. We have to think differently. We have to think about the kingdom of God. The big picture, right? We have to think like Jesus did. We have to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives you. If you see someone that needs prayer, stop and pray for them right away, right where they are at. If you feel like God is telling you to help someone in need, you need to help that person. If you feel God prompting you to do, some, to do something uh, or tell someone something that God has given you to say, then you need to say it. Amen? You need to listen to the voice of God understand what God is speaking to you and then do what God is telling you to do. Our thinking has to change and our actions have to change. We have to be about the work of the Father building His kingdom. We have to become kingdom builders, the kingdom mindset. Amen? And we have to move to a whole different level.